So uh, in the lead into this, we did engage in a little bit of discussion about, you know, what topic we might uh, like to present. And uh, we understand there's been a fair bit of interest in discussing myeloma. And I presume you're all here today because you're interested in hearing more about myeloma. So um, certainly a condition we encounter relatively commonly as haematologists. Um, I've entitled the talk, Where Are We in 2020? Um, really, I guess, just to give you an update of where we are from a diagnosis point of view, where we are from a prognosis point of view, and what the treatment landscape in myeloma looks like in the modern era, because it certainly changed a lot in the last 10, 15, 20 years. So look, I apologise, maybe, uh, maybe it's the educator in me, but I always feel dodgy doing a talk without putting up some learning objectives, so uh, we'll make sure we tick all of these five learning objectives before the end of uh, today's talk. Uh, so I want to touch a little bit on diagnostic aspects of myeloma. How do we make a diagnosis? Uh, how have things changed in the modern era in terms of how we achieve a diagnosis? And there have been a few little refinements and changes. Uh, mechanisms by which we assess prognosis. Um, and certainly where we are now compared to 10 to 15 years ago, we do have um, some refinements to our prognostic techniques um, and some more sophisticated ways we can look at prognosis, including some of the DNA profiling that we do. Uh, we'll review some of the different types of testing we do. Some of this will be, you know, for those who are affected by myeloma or have family members or friends affected by myeloma. We'll be hopefully familiar with some of the terminology I'm using here. Um, words like paraprotein, for example, and mechanisms by which we monitor myeloma through the disease course. Um, I'll then touch on, on treatment aspects. And, you know, treatment for myeloma has evolved quite substantially. Um, there's a lot we can talk about in terms of treatment, but I'll run through a little bit of how we make decisions regarding initial treatment um, and talk a little bit, addressing point number five there, of some of, the, some of the new treatments that are filtering through. All right, so I've already been kindly introduced. Um, I'm WA born and bred. I was locally trained as a haematologist. Um, I've worked interstate um, in a research setting, including in the myeloma realm. Um, I've worked at many of the major hospitals in Perth, but I'm currently nice and settled at, um, at Royal Perth and St. John's Midland. And I guess you guys have already been given a little bit of a preamble in this, in this regard. Um, so what do you want out of today? What do I want out of today? I'm certainly very receptive, you know, to any questions or comments. Um, just reiterating that, that my passions are not only in the high quality medical care for my patients, but in keeping them supported and informed during their cancer journey. And I'd like to hope that, that I, along with most of my colleagues, do a better job of that these days. I think, um, you know, in, in times gone by, um, you know, patients perhaps weren't quite as well informed during their cancer journey as they used to be. And uh, to me, that's often the, the most scary part, perhaps even more scary than the cancer diagnosis, actually, the uncertainty of what's happening, what do I expect, what side effects might I get from treatment. So... I certainly hope we as a haematology collective deal with that better these days, um, but I guess a work in progress. Um, another of my passions is improving equity of access to cancer services for patients, uh, and again addressing my, my recent role with the WA Country Health Service um, across the state. Um, we know that um, access to cancer services and cancer outcomes may be worse than those in the rural and remote setting. Um, you know, so it's something that we're working quite hard to try and improve in the modern era. Um, and again, we've already touched on the fact that I, I enjoy education and hopefully I can provide a little bit of that today. Um, so let's talk a little bit about myeloma demographics. Who does, who does myeloma affect? <clears throat> so myeloma affects both men and women. Uh, it affects men a little bit more commonly, not dramatically more so, but a little bit more commonly. Uh, from an age point of view, myeloma is predominantly a disease of older age. And I don't say that in an ageist way, and I apologise to anyone I might have insulted in the audience. Um, it's rare to see myeloma in younger age groups. We don't tend to see it in people. Uh, I think I've seen one person with myeloma in their late 20s. It's pretty uncommon. Uh, much more beyond the age of 50. Um, some of the data there on the table on the right, I'm not sure how well that projects. Um, it's, it's a little old now, it's a bit over a decade old, but really just to give you an idea of some of the distribution of age ranges for those affected by myeloma, that is Australian data. So just to elaborate on that a little bit more, um, we can see there, and again this is Australian data from 2019, uh, that a little over 2,000 people were diagnosed with, with myeloma. There's a slight male uh, preponderance, and 
myeloma in general accounted for about 1.4% of cases of new, uh, new cancer diagnoses. So we put it in perspective. Um, myeloma is certainly not amongst the most common cancers, but it's certainly, uh, there's uh, certainly a fair bit that we do in the myeloma realm, and we see a fair bit of hema, uh, myeloma as haematologists. What is myeloma? Um, myeloma is, is a bone marrow cancer, and a bone marrow cancer where the cancer cells, or the abnormal cells, are antibody-making white blood cells. And we're seeing an example here of a, a bone marrow for someone with myeloma. These cells here are the plasma cells, or abnormal antibody-making cells. They're usually, you know, maybe haematologists get a little bit too excited about cool things they see under the microscope, um, but they're usually quite distinctive. So we can usually pick a diagnosis of myeloma under the microscope quite quickly because those plasma cells are quite distinctive. They're quite uh, boldly staining and they're laden with a whole pile of protein. So uh, pinning down that a little bit more, what are some of the things we see in myeloma? So given that these abnormal antibody producing cells are largely found in the bone marrow and they're making this abnormal antibody, this explains some of the consequences and some of the features of, uh, that we do see in people with myeloma. So Myeloma can cause high calcium levels. Those high calcium levels can produce a number of symptoms, including fatigue, uh, drowsiness in extreme cases, uh, or constipation, amongst other things. Uh, the abnormal protein, or paraprotein, may deposit in the kidneys, and it may cause kidney damage. For most people, uh, and certainly my experience in people with myeloma, is they either don't have kidney impairment or have only relatively mild kidney impairment at diagnosis, but we can see all ends of the spectrum, and people with myeloma may occasionally present with advanced kidney failure needing dialysis. Uh, because these abnormal cells start to build up and build up and build up in the bone marrow, they often crowd out the production of normal blood cells. And it's very common to see people with a drop in their normal blood count. So anemia, low white blood cell count, uh, low platelets resulting in increased risk of bruising and bleeding, as well as infection, uh, are also a common feature. And again, because of the location of the myeloma and the abnormal cells, uh, we often see damage to the bone. So we might see people with bone pain. Uh, we can also see sometimes fractures. And I've certainly seen people present with myeloma for the first time with a broken bone, and then we've discovered the myeloma. So you might have got the impression from some of the highlighted words I've seen there, and I suspect half of you in the room are myeloma experts, um, is that we use a particular acronym to refer to some of what we call the end organ dysfunction or damage to the body resulting from myeloma. That acronym is, can anyone guess what the acronym is? No? <laughs> okay, so we use the acronym CRAB, C for high calcium, R for renal or kidney impairment, A for anemia, and B for bone problems. It's a relatively easy one to remember. So who's heard of the word paraprotein? Anyone heard of the word paraprotein? A few people? Yep. So what is a paraprotein? Okay, you kind of, we kind of mysteriously chuck that word out, paraprotein. Sounds kind of weird. Well, if we go back to the, the basic definitions, plasma cells, which are the cells that go rogue in myeloma, um, are antibody-producing cells. So when some of the plasma cells turn into abnormal or cancerous cells, the type of antibody they make is an abnormal antibody, and that's what we call a paraprotein. A paraprotein is an abnormal antibody made by abnormal or cancerous plasma cells. Um, we've got a couple of other pretty pictures up there. Um, the uh, diagram there in the, or the picture in the bottom left uh, is a representation of an, an antibody, of what a normal antibody or in fact an abnormal antibody would look like. And it comprises two components. Kind of looks like a bit of a Y shape, right? So the big part of the Y is what we call the heavy chain. And the two little bits attached to the prongs of the wire, what we call light, light chains. Um, and again, for those who are familiar with paraproteins, um, you might have been told you have an IgG kappa paraprotein or an IgA lambda paraprotein or something like that. That refers to the different components of the antibody. So IgG or IgA would be the heavy chain component and kappa or lambda would be the light chain component. Does that broadly make sense or have I just baffled you? Kind of makes sense? All right, so further elaborating on the paraprotein, what do we use paraprotein for? Well, the paraprotein for us has, has a dual role. Firstly, it's in making a diagnosis. So if you do a blood test on someone and you pick up a paraprotein, 
by using this little fancy technique where we run proteins across an electrically charged gel. Um, that implies the presence of abnormal antibody-producing cells. Um, so a paraprotein always means abnormal antibody-producing cells, such as plasma cells. So that's number one. We need a paraprotein to firm up a diagnosis. Number two, we use a paraprotein in disease monitoring. Um, again, for those of you who are familiar with the concept of a paraprotein, when you go into your clinic appointment to your haematologist, often one of the first things that you'll discuss is, what's my paraprotein doing? Has it gone up? Is it stable? Is it going down? And the reason for that is, if you've got a certain number of abnormal cancerous plasma cells producing a certain amount of abnormal paraprotein, if you start treatment and the treatment is effective and you're killing plasma cells, you expect the paraprotein to start dropping. It makes sense as well. Um, and in fact, the International Myeloma Working Group, along with other federations that uh, track myeloma diagnostics and treatment approaches, um, have a set of criteria we used, a large part of which is based on how far the paraprotein levels have dropped to refer to remission status in myeloma. So how much have you knocked the myeloma on the head? And that can range anywhere from what we call progressive disease, where the CRAB criteria or the damage to the body is getting worse um, and the paraprotein is going up, um, all the way through different levels of remission, from partial remission to very good partial remission through to a complete remission where the paraprotein is no longer detectable. Um, probably a little bit beyond the scope of today's talk to discuss that in detail, but happy to answer any questions about that. So, now that you've heard me rambling on for the last five, ten minutes, time for a question. Which type of white blood cell is the cancer cell of multiple myeloma? Is it A, the neutrophil, with a little happy smiley face in the top left? B, the wombat? Does anyone think it's the wombat? No? Okay. <laughs> C, the prison cell. D, the plasma cell. E, the neuron. Any takers? Plasma cell. Excellent. Was that question too easy? Did I need a harder question? Maybe the next question will be harder. We'll see. All right. So how do we make a diagnosis of myeloma? We've spoken a bit about paraproteins and the requirement for the presence of an abnormal antibody. Uh, we've spoken about CRAB criteria. It's, it's a little bit trickier, and I, I guess in many ways I won't dwell on this too much, but there actually is a clinical and pathological continuum of disorders associated with abnormal plasma cells. Not all of them are uh, overt cancer-type phenomena. So at the most base level and the most, um, I guess, least aggressive level, we have a condition known as MGUS, or monoclonal gammopathy of uncertain significance. See if you can say that ten times fast. Um, so we actually know from biologic studies that myeloma pretty much always comes about from precursor MGUS. Um, so anyone who's been diagnosed with myeloma probably will have had MGUS. It just may not have been detected prior to the time of myeloma. Um, and that's no fault of anyone. It's usually a completely benign condition where you have a little bit of abnormal antibody or paraprotein and it just sits there in the background and doesn't do anything. Relatively common in people over the age of 70 or 80 um, and has a risk of progression to myeloma of about 1% per year. So you can appreciate if you're diagnosed with MGUS at the age of 80, 85, what's your likelihood of developing myeloma in your remaining lifetime? You know, and yes, we're all going to live to 130, but even then, it's a pretty low risk of developing myeloma. The next step up that continuum is something we call smouldering multiple myeloma. Now, smouldering multiple myeloma, basically as we push up this continuum we're developing an increasing burden um, of abnormal plasma cells in the body. In smouldering myeloma, typically the level of paraprotein is higher, the percentage of abnormal plasma cells in the bone marrow is higher, but there's no CRAB criteria, okay? So there's no evidence of any damage to the body. Historically, we would say for people with smouldering multiple myeloma, they don't need treatment. And certainly if we had this discussion probably even five years ago, maybe a little more than that, we would say smouldering myeloma, yes, there's more plasma cells, there's a higher risk of progression to myeloma, somewhere between 10 to 30% per year, but doesn't require treatment. In the modern era, that's changed a little bit, and I'll, I'll touch on that again in a moment. And then multiple myeloma, well, making a diagnosis of multiple myeloma in many ways is a little easier. Um, 
if you've got any CRAB criteria, regardless of how many plasma cells you've got in your body, regardless of your paraprotein, you have multiple myeloma. Now, generally, you will have a reasonable level of paraprotein, a level of over 30, give or take, and you will have over 10% plasma cells in your bone marrow. But if you've got CRAB criteria or damage to the body, then that constitutes myeloma. So just to elaborate on that a little bit more, um, and look, there's, it's a pretty busy slide and there's a lot of information on here, but I guess what I want to draw your, draw your attention to is just this component here. Um, so the historic thinking is symptomatic myeloma, myeloma that needs treatment, has to have CRAB criteria. We now recognise that there are some markers of substantial disease burden where you've got more than 60% plasma cells in your bone marrow or large amounts of paraprotein or abnormal light chains that reflect that you're on the precipice of tipping over into myeloma, that you're about to develop CRAB criteria. Now, logic kind of dictates... Do we actually want to sit on these people, people who are about to tip over into myeloma and maybe get kidney failure or maybe get a broken bone, or do we actually want to start treatment? Again, logic dictates we want to start treatment in these people. We don't wait. Um, so that's certainly one of the new developments over the last five years or so. People with a high plasma cell burden, even without damage to the body, based on CRAB criteria, we will initiate on treatment. All right, so... The sequence of making a diagnosis, a lot of this we've alluded to already. Certainly anyone who comes to my clinic, and I suspect with, with your doctors as well, um, you know, we'll sit down with you, we'll have a chat with you, explore any symptoms that are symptoms associated with myeloma or the CRAB criteria of myeloma. We'll do a relevant examination, and then we'll go on to do various lab tests. Some of these will no doubt be familiar to you, but checking your blood counts, checking your kidneys, checking your calcium level, looking for that end organ dysfunction of myeloma. We also do some additional testing to give us some concepts of disease biology. So um, is there a large burden of plasma cells in the body or myeloma cells? Um, is this behaving in an aggressive way? So that's what um, the albumin, the beta-2 microglobulin and the LDH are, are part of and part of our staging systems for myeloma. Um, anyone who has myeloma will usually cop a bone marrow biopsy. Um, does anyone have a diagnosis of myeloma who didn't have a bone marrow biopsy? Probably unlikely. Generally, we do do a bone marrow biopsy on people to, number one, firm up a diagnosis. And number two, it also allows us, bearing in mind that generally, and again, this may change going forward as we get more sophisticated techniques, but generally the abnormal cells live in the bone marrow. So to actually look at the mutations or the DNA abnormalities with the condition, we need to go into the bone marrow to figure it all out. What about scans? Um, again, everyone with myeloma is likely to have had scans at some stage, and the large part of those scans are looking for evidence of, of bone that's been damaged, what we call lytic lesions um, in the bones in myeloma. Uh, the historic way we would do that is in using what's called a skeletal survey, um, and I suspect some people in the room would have had skeletal surveys where you have a series of x-rays looking at your bones. Um, we do find in the modern era that we see more and more CT skeletal surveys being done. So we actually use a CAT scanner to look at the bones. Um, and the reason for that is it um, gives us a more detailed view, is more likely to pick up smaller lesions than the X-rays. And the dose of radiation from a CAT scanner in the modern era is much less than it used to be. So uh, we tend to use CT skeletal surveys more often these days. Um, we will occasionally also do MRI scans and occasionally also do PET scans. A PET scan is a very sensitive cancer scan. Has anyone had a PET scan? Yep. So there are a variety of reasons we might do a PET scan. Um, it's sometimes useful in distinguishing abnormal areas in the body or in the bones uh, as to whether they're active myeloma or just an area where there was previous myeloma. Um, they're also useful in people where we're looking for... Um, I guess what we describe as occult disease. So areas where you may not historically look, looking for solid lumps of myeloma or plasma cytomas. All right, so look, again, for those who haven't had any of these um, scans done in the past, this is my understanding of how they're done. Um, is it, for those who've had them, is this, is this an accurate assessment? Yep. Okay, I think probably many of us would be quite happy to have the scan on the, uh, scan on the right. Have a few uh, have a few pooch cuddles. Uh, 
Um, all right, so another question. Sadly, I don't think this question is actually going to be harder than my last question, so I'm sorry to disappoint, but what is a paraprotein? A, a muscle-building powder favoured by bodybuilders. B, a gliding device. C, the abnormal antibody made by abnormal plasma cells in myeloma. Any ideas? Excellent, excellent. All right. Look, look, I can tell you A is more applicable to me. I can assure you there's... It may be concealed, but there's quite a six-pack underneath here. Um, So I use a fair bit of protein powder. I just don't use paraprotein powder. Actually, don't use a lot of protein powder. It's not good for your kidneys. The bodybuilding people aren't going to like me, are they? Okay. All right, so how are we going uh, time-wise? There we go. Oh, so okay. oh, excellent. Okay. Ah, no worries. Still got plenty of time. Good. Um, so what do we mean by staging? Staging in myeloma really has a – is a different concept of what you might consider staging in other cancer varieties. When you talk to many people about staging, they think about – solid tumours. They think about what's the experience in someone with bowel cancer or lung cancer or breast cancer. That um, An early stage is where you've got a discrete lump in one spot and an advanced stage is where you've got lumps that have spread to a lot of other areas. Well, we know in myeloma it's a little bit different. Myeloma, I guess, for want of a better way to describe it, exists largely in, in liquid phase. It doesn't uh, Putting aside those who have plasma cytomas, it largely lives in the bone marrow. So we can't really apply that traditional sort of staging to myeloma. So the staging techniques used in myeloma really are intended to give us an idea of disease burden. So how much myeloma is there in the body? Is there only a small amount of myeloma in the body, in the bone marrow? Or is there a large amount? And how is it behaving? Is it growing slowly or is it growing quickly? Uh, There are a number of techniques that have been used historically. The one used most commonly these days is called the International Staging System. Um, which comprises two parameters, the one that I mentioned before, beta-2 microglobulin and albumin. And in the more recent times, we've, we've created a revised ISS, um, which incorporates some other markers of disease biology, the LDH, which tends to be higher in those with quicker growing disease, and also some of the DNA testing we do, some of the mutation testing. So, so what is the DNA testing? So the DNA testing we typically do in myeloma looks specifically at the myeloma cells, the abnormal plasma cells, and it looks for evidence of um, addition or removal of genetic material or changeover between chromosomes where two genes are put next to each other. And we actually do that by a, a technique called, called fish studies. Uh, not, so fish as in I've gone fishing, but it has a completely different implication. Um, see if anyone can remember this one. Fish is fluorescent in situ hybridisation. Can anyone repeat that back to me? Okay, it's a bit, a bit of a tricky one. Um, it's basically a technique where we use fluorescent probes um, which are associated with a particular DNA sequence um, and then attached and attach them or put them together with the myeloma cells. Um, and that allows us to identify whether there are particular areas where um, there's been a mutation, whether there's been an a- addition or removal of genetic material or where genes have been put next to each other where they shouldn't have been. And we know that some of these genetic abnormalities carry a higher risk, myeloma that tends to misbehave a little bit more, and those that carry a standard risk. Um, I think it was decided that we were never going to describe low risk per se, so we've just got a standard risk and a high risk category. Um, And again, I won't discuss that in, in too much more detail, but there are a variety of different DNA abnormalities we look for. And this is routine for everyone who has a bone marrow for myeloma. We will generally do this testing. So what's the reason for doing the testing? Well, it does give us some instruction about how we expect the myeloma to behave. If you look at the two graphs on the left, that refers to a data set between 2001 and 2005. So it's getting on a little bit now. The data set on the right refers to the patients since 2005. In the top left, you can see the ISS stage, where stage one and stage two uh, are at the top. In the, in the green and the red lines, and then stage three is the, is the blue line. And that's, um, they're, they're basically survival curves. Um, and we can see that those with more advanced stage, um, the survival doesn't tend to be as good. Um, similarly, those with the blue curve at the bottom with the higher risk fish studies or DNA testing, 
uh, don't tend to do as well as those with standard risk fish. If you actually then compare it to the graphs on the right, you can already see, even between 2001 to 2005 and then those since 2005, that there's been quite a significant improvement in survival, and we will talk a little bit about that in a moment. Now, I very deliberately put this slide in because I want to be very clear, and I, I always have these discussions with my patients when we're talking about prognosis. You know, we're talking about a cancer diagnosis, we're talking about something that is um, potentially life-shortening and something that's potentially quite scary. Um, everyone is an individual. You know, I, I can come out here and say, you've got this particular DNA, abnorm DNA abnormality that carries a higher risk, you've got these particular disease features that carry a higher risk. We're proven wrong time and time again. Everyone's an individual. This is population data encompassing thousands of people. Uh, and, I, and I can tell you that's very much the case. I've seen people with DNA testing that suggests a more aggressive disease and those people have treatment and then end up doing really well. So do just bear that in mind. Myeloma is a complex condition. It's more than just the ISS stage. It's more than just the DNA testing. Um, there are many things that impact it. A patient's age, um, the general physical condition, the response to initial treatment. <clears throat> um, the, the latter is quite important as well because we do know that um, the deeper the remission we can achieve, as a general rule, the longer the remission tends to last. Um, and that applies generally across the board. There's no guarantee, but we always strive to get as deep a remission as possible because that improves our chances of a longer remission. So what about treatment approaches? Treat, treatment has advanced quite a lot in the last couple of decades. Um, and I guess, you know, um, for those of you in the room with myeloma or those affected by myeloma, um, you may have potentially seen some of the changes that have come through. There's been a transition from largely traditional chemotherapy, steroid-type approaches, to a number of new drugs. Um, and along with this, we've seen quite a significant improvement in survival from myeloma. Um, and I'll show you the graph related to this in a moment. But from Australian data, between for those diagnosed between 86 to 90 compared to those diagnosed between 2011 to 2015, um, survival has almost doubled in that time frame. And this continues to improve. Um, a large amount of this does reflect the improved efficiency and effectiveness of the treatments. Um, we've got a greater number of options these days. Um, and arguably less side effects and less toxicity. And I, I do say arguably because those of you who have had myeloma treatment, um, I'm sure there'll be many people who put up their hands and say, are you telling me these treatments don't have side effects? I'm certainly not saying that. I, I recognise, we all recognise that even in the modern era, our treatments do very much have side effects, but arguably fewer side effects than, than some of the more aggressive chemotherapy approaches of the past. So uh, this is here uh, demonstrated in the graph that I promised you, um, showing the survival curves. And this is, this is Australia, uh, so this is Australian data. And you can see there when you compare people diagnosed back in the sort of mid to late 80s compared to you know, the more recent time frame, there's been an improvement of about 28% to 51% five-year survival from the time of diagnosis. Bear in mind as well that 2011 to 2015 is five to ten years ago. And unequivocally, there's been further improvement since that time as we have new treatments come through and new treatment combinations come through. All right, so what are the treatment options? Now, I apologise, this is a fairly, fairly busy and uh, word-laden slide. Uh, but we'll, we'll work through it. Um, one of the first things your haematologist will generally be trying to decide when they make a diagnosis is, are you a candidate for a stem cell transplant? Um, so I, I, pres I presume some people in the room may have had a stem cell transplant. Any takers? Yep, a few people. Yep. So uh, stem cell transplant, or I guess probably the more accurate term for it is high-dose chemotherapy with stem cell rescue because in many ways all, all we're transplanting is transplanting your own baby bone marrow cells or your own uh, uh, stem cells or blood cells. Uh, it doesn't involve transplant of someone else's genetic material or biologic material. Um, how do we decide who is transplant eligible? Um, so, so I guess stepping back for a moment before we come to that, 
one of the first things we want to know is whether someone is a candidate for a stem cell transplant because that still remains one of, if not the most potent, anti-myeloma treatment. So we want to determine if someone is suitable for one of the more potent treatment options we have available. There are a number of things that influence this decision. Now, again, if we were discussing this 10, 15, 20 years ago, you would probably say, well, you're over a certain age cutoff, you're over 65, no, nope, you're too old. You can't have a stem cell transplant. I think we all know in the modern era that's probably a little bit simplistic. Um, we understand there's a difference between biologic age and physiologic age. So you might be 85 years old and you might be in excellent physical condition. I should, I should say we don't do many transplants on 85-year-olds. Um, uh, perhaps let me bring that back a little bit. You might be 70 to 75 and you might be in very good physical condition. Um, and might be very suitable for a stem cell transplant. By the same token, you might be 50 years old and you might have advanced heart disease and lung disease and the rigours of high-dose chemotherapy might be too much for you. Um, so that's a process we work through and we work through with our patients. Those who are transplant eligible, where we intend to give high-dose chemotherapy and stem cell rescue, we will generally treat upfront with bortezomib-based therapy um, so a number of you, I suspect, would have had Velcade or Bortezomib. And we usually give um, up to 16 doses, collect some stem cells, give high-dose chemo, give you your stem cells back to repair your damaged bone marrow from the high-dose chemo. <clears throat> and then for most people, not across the board, but for most people, we tend to go down the path of maintenance therapy, where we typically give you an oral agent, historically thalidomide, and hopefully more so in the current era, lenalidomide, um, which can help to deepen and prolong remission after a stem cell transplant. For those who are transplant ineligible, uh, and again, I'm simplifying it here um, because there are a lot of treatment options available, we will generally either go with bortezomib-based therapy for up to around a year's worth of treatment, which is what's covered by Medicare, um, or we give lenalidomide or Revlimid, which is, um, which is a tablet option. Um, and, you know, we explore the pros and the cons with our patients in relation to that. Obviously, the tablets have some convenience factor associated with them as opposed to the injections of bortezomib, but there are pros and cons of both. The other thing to bear in mind when we're talking about treatment is uh, obviously we're very focused on what can we give you from a treatment point of view that uh, will improve your outcome, that will knock the myeloma on the head, that will keep it at bay, that will put you into a deep remission. But it's not all about that. We need to apply appropriate supportive care as well. Um, so you'll often see as part of myeloma treatment regimens that we will give some sort of anti-infective agents. We might give antiviral medications like valacyclovir or Valtrex to prevent shingles infections. Uh, we will, for most people, uh, generally give some sort of bone strengthening medication such as Zometa or Pemidronate or other things that I suspect, again, people in the room will have had at various stages. So just to summarise that, if someone is going down the stem cell transplant pathway, we'll typically give 16 doses of Cybor-D, that's the classical regimen where we give uh, low-dose chemo pills, cyclophosphamide, uh, bortezomib, the Velcade injections, and D for dexamethasone. Um, then give high-dose chemotherapy, typically with a drug called melphalan. Um, give the stem cells back to recover the bone marrow and then move on to a maintenance phase of therapy for most people. For those who are non-transplant eligible, we typically similarly give Cyborg D <clears throat> as, as long as it's subsidised through Medicare, um, or lenalidomide and steroid um, until disease progression or toxicity. So what I mean by that is um, for those who've been on lenalidomide or similar drugs, <clears throat> uh, we, we basically just tend to continue the treatment indefinitely. So as long as it's tolerated okay, you're not having major side effects or problems, and it's still working that the paraprotein's not going up substantially or there's damage to the body with progressive CRAB criteria, we tend to just continue the treatment indefinitely. And look, there are a variety of other treatment options, various chemotherapy pills and other things, and again, certainly happy in question time to explore some of that with you as well. All right, so another question. What is Cyborg D? A, a commonly used treatment combination in multiple myeloma containing low-dose chemo pills, a weekly injection and some steroid pills, B, a part human, part robot, C, a medieval weapon. Any ideas? All right, I guess it's A. I really should have made these questions harder, shouldn't I? All right. <clears throat> 
Um, <clears throat> now I'm just looking time wise. I'm still got about ten slides to go, so I might. I won't rush through them, but I'll be a little bit selective, so we do have a bit of time for questions. Um, in fact, what I'll probably do is I might skip through how the treatments work, um, because the mechanism for how the treatments work, the proteasome inhibitors, the IMIDs, so proteasome inhibitors are drugs like uh, bortezomib, carfilzomib, um, IMIDs are drugs like thalidomide, lenalidomide, pomalidomide. Um, they're relatively complex, and look, I've put up all these fancy schmancy scientific diagrams, I don't expect you to, to follow them in great detail. just makes the slide look a little bit prettier, doesn't it? Some nice colours on the slide. Um, but again, happy to answer questions about that later. Um, what are the side effects of treatment? Uh, again, I'm really focusing down on some of the more common side effects here. Um, there are a broad spectrum of side effects that can, can come from treatment, but the ones we focus on most of all as haematologists, and, and I suspect that you may have come across... Uh, with bortezomib or Velcade, um, peripheral neuropathy can be an issue. Um, and I suspect we have, we've got people in the room who've had peripheral neuropathy related to, to Velcade. Um, usually this peripheral neuropathy, is, it, which essentially refers to nerve irritation related to the drug, um, is a sensory neuropathy. So you get a little bit of a change in feeling like tingling or burning or numbness. We describe it, and this is a very fancy medical term, we describe it as a glove and stocking neuropathy because it happens where you would put on gloves and stockings, your hands and your feet. Um, for most people, they won't get it at all, or if they do get it, it'll be relatively mild. But we're always attentive to it because there'll be a small proportion of patients who can get quite severe neuropathy where the abnormal sensation goes all the way up the legs or all the way up the arms or there's a motor component, so that actually means that there's actually some weakness that develops in the muscles. We don't really want it to reach that stage. We, we want to actually start reducing the dose or stopping it before it gets to that stage. Um, again, don't worry about it too much for those who might be on bortezomib. That severity of neuropathy is relatively uncommon, but you will usually find that your haematologist, um, uh, your chemotherapy nurse will ask you some of those questions about the nerve irritation symptoms. Lenalidomide. Um, the most common thing I encounter with lenalidomide is low blood counts. In many ways, not really an ideal thing for people who often start at relatively low blood counts. Um, but usually the low blood counts are manageable, but we do need to watch patients for that. You know, if the blood counts are getting unmanageably low and the immune system's copying a major hit from very low white blood cells or we're needing a lot of transfusions to support the low blood counts, we need to review it again. Um, and that's more common in people who have a degree of kidney impairment because lenalidomide levels tend to build up a little bit in the body in those patients. So how effective are the treatments? The short answer is myeloma treatments in the modern era are actually generally pretty effective. Uh, most people will respond uh, to upfront treatment. So if we look at the, uh, the table here on the left, this is indicating overall response rate, so basically those who are achieving any sort of response to treatment. With some of the base regimens we use, like lenalidomide and steroids, dexamethasone, or bortezomib and dexamethasone, or the combination with the low-dose chemotherapy pill, the cyclophosphamide, we're getting response rates of you know, 75 to 80%, which is pretty good. That continues to improve as we're becoming a little bit more sophisticated in how we're delivering the treatment. Um, or... Um, when we actually combine the treatments uh, together, so when we actually combine a proteasome inhibitor like bortezomib and an imid like lenalidomide into what we call triplets of therapy. Uh, triplet therapy is not, um, has been available overseas, such as in the US for a more extended period of time. Uh, not quite there in Australia as yet, but it appears we're very close to that. And, you know, we're um, delighted with the prospect of being able to use those combinations hopefully soon um, because you can see that as we're getting into some of the more and more potent regimens, um, now look, I'm not going to guarantee anyone, unfortunately, we can jump straight into carfilzomib, lenalidomide and dexamethasone, but quite nice to see an 100% response rate. So basically every patient is responding. Um, the other thing to make note about in terms of treatment is um, if we're choosing between lenalidomide and bortezomib as upfront therapy, I would tend to favour bortezomib in someone where there's an impetus to debulk the myeloma quite quickly, to flush out the abnormal plasma cells, to get rid of the paraprotein, such as those who've got a significant amount of kidney impairment. Because we know the bortezomib works more quickly than the lenalidomide, 
Um, and you can see here, this is an example of what happens to the paraprotein um, as an average for people on bortezomib-based therapy. Even after one cycle, it's already dropped by 60% on average. Um, okay. Good. Still just aware of the time, folks. Um, treatments in relapsed refractory disease. So we know that myeloma broadly is an incurable condition. We expect to see the myeloma in people will generally come back over time. Hopefully we're getting deeper and longer remissions these days, but there is an expectation that it does creep back over time. Um, we always have to balance out, and I often explore these discussions with my patients, that um, we've got to balance out uh, quality of life issues and quantity of life issues. Um, the good thing is in the modern era, we've got a lot of new treatment options available and we've got a lot of treatments in relapsed disease. So usually we can say, okay, you've relapsed, let's pop you on this. The toxicity or the side effects associated with this are generally manageable, but it's always important we do discuss that with our patients um, and, you know, have those things explored with you. Um, you know, what are the pros and cons of going ahead with treatment? Um, one thing I like to make note of when I'm talking about treatment in relapsed disease is this concept here of clonal tiding. So if, for example, you're diagnosed with myeloma, your initial treatment has a, a spine of bortezomib, so you're treated with velcade or bortezomib, what usually happens is the myeloma responds, a large portion of the myeloma cells die off, and you go into a remission, and the myeloma remains at bay, um, and hopefully that remission lasts for a, you know, an extended period of time. What about that small percentage of cells that are left behind? They're the cells that are likely to be bortezomib resistant, right? Because they haven't died off after exposure to bortezomib. So the argument is for those people when they start to relapse, there's some likelihood that the cells that are starting to grow back are cells that may be resistant to bortezomib. So ideally what you'd do is you'd consider switching to another class of drug. So rather than using a proteasome inhibitor, you might use an imid like lenalidomide, for example. Now, that doesn't hold 100% true. And I want to be very clear that people can often very effectively be treated by transitioning from one proteasome inhibitor to another. So, for example, from bortezomib to carfilzomib or from one imid to another, like lenalidomide to pomalidomide. But we do always factor that in. You know, we may consider the concept of class switching, just thinking about the biology of the cells that are, that are growing back. Uh, okay, so look, what are the drugs used in relapse? Um, again, we're running a little short on time, so carfilzomib. I suspect there's some experience with carfilzomib in the room. Um, generally, generally pretty well tolerated. It's given intravenously, and my experiences with carfilzomib have been pretty favourable so far. Um, patients, even with latter stages of relapse, often do tend to respond to treatment. Um, pomalidomide, again, part of that same class of drugs as thalidomide and lenalidomide. Um, can also usually is often also effective in people with relapsed refractory disease. Has one of the advantages that it can be given at full dose in kidney failure, whereas lenalidomide can't. Um, another stem cell transplant sometimes. Um, and again, for the sake of time, I won't elaborate on that, but I'm, I'm happy to answer questions surrounding that. So what's new? What's coming through? Um, antibody treatments. Antibody treatments have been increasingly well established in certain realms of haematology, such as lymphoma treatment for some time now. Um, and they're really starting to emerge now in the myeloma realm. So basically, you know, we've already discussed the concept of antibodies. Your body normally makes antibodies. Antibodies are infection-fighting proteins. Well, the antibodies I'm talking about here are laboratory-made antibodies. And rather than their target being bacteria or viruses, um, which is what your body's natural antibodies do, the target of these are myeloma cells. So, for example, daratumumab um, is an anti-CD38 antibody. CD38 is a protein that's found on the surface of myeloma cells, and daratumumab sticks to CD38 expressing cells and kills them. Similarly, elatuzumab binds to something called SLAM-F7 um, and kills cells by that mechanism. So it's a type of immunotherapy using a laboratory-made antibody. These medications aren't available on Medicare or through the Pharmaceutical Benefit Scheme as yet, but there are some potential mechanisms of accessing them through either clinical trials or through compassionate access. CAR T-cells. People often ask me about CAR T-cells. Has anyone read about CAR T-cells? A little bit? Yeah. Um, look, very promising, very interesting. Um, 
still in many ways in relatively early stages um, for myeloma, um, certainly not an established therapy in myeloma. CAR T cells are basically another type of immunotherapy. So rather than antibody-based immunotherapy, such as daratumumab, elituzumab, it's cellular immunotherapy. So we use another type of immune cell, a T lymphocyte, to attack myeloma cells. Um, increasingly, this sort of treatment is likely to move forward in uh, conditions like acute lymphoblastic leukaemia and aggressive lymphomas in Australia. But watch this space in myeloma. It's certainly under investigation in myeloma. And look, there's lots of other drugs that are being looked at and have been looked at. Um, drugs like uh, venetoclax, histone deacetylase inhibitors. Again, we could talk about these things for hours, but um, lot, lots of things uh, moving through. So how might treatment look over the coming years? Well, I think firstly, we're, we're excited about the emergence of triplet therapy, so the combination of a proteasome inhibitor, uh, an immunomodulatory drug and steroids, which we know carry a greater, greater effectiveness and deeper emissions. Um, the addition of antibody therapy, so drugs like daratumumab, used alone or more often in combination with lenalidomide-based regimens, and we're hoping this will, as more and more evidence mounts, become available on Medicare and through the PBS over time. Uh, the ongoing investigation of the role of CAR T cells, still to some degree in their infancy, but ongoing investigation. Will we say goodbye to the stem cell transplant? Um, this is a topic that's often discussed at haematological conferences. Um, and the rationale for that is that stem cell transplants carry toxicity. You know, we give high-dose chemotherapy. There are risks associated with it. And we know that with these increasingly effective new drugs and combinations, that maybe that's actually almost as effective as a stem cell transplant. So watch this space. So look, I've just got a couple of summary slides, and then maybe there's time for a couple of minutes of questions. Um, so where are we in 2020? From a diagnostic point of view, we still use a lot of our traditional diagnostic techniques, blood tests, bone marrow biopsies, our understanding of when to treat myeloma, however, is becoming more sophisticated, including recognising those people who have high-risk disease features or a high disease burden, where we want to start treatment before they develop damage to the body um, indicated by CRAB criteria. Um, we also have better techniques um, in terms of identifying lower volumes of myelomatous disease, particularly bone disease, including the utilisation of CT skeletal surveys, MRI and PET. From a prognosis point of view, we know that the prognosis of myeloma has come along in leaps and bounds over the last 20 to 30 years, and is probably somewhere between doubled to tripled in that time frame. This likely reflects a combination of better diagnostic tools, assessing when to treat, better treatments, and lower treatment toxicity. And we also have better ways to assess prognosis, including more sophisticated staging systems and using DNA or mutation type studies. From a treatment point of view, there have been major advances in the last 20 to 30 years, as I've noted, and, and these treatments continue to advance at a rapid rate, and I guess we've, we've touched on that, so I won't dwell on that much more. So one last question before we wrap up. Which of the following is more likely? A, a visit to your haematologist without a blood test. B, a Fremantle Dockers premiership. C, contact with a sentient alien species. Now, before you answer, I'm actually, I'm actually a Dockers supporter, so be kind. Any thoughts? Or are all of them exceedingly unlikely? <laughs> AA is probably the least, least unlikely? All right, good. So look, nothing really too much more there. Um, we need to give a little bit of time for questions. So thank you, everyone. I hope I haven't bored you too much. I really loved the audience participation that you included. That was great. Um, please, um, thank you for... Um, acknowledging the, this talk today. It was really fantastic. Are there any questions? And we'll use the roving mic and I'll get you to use this one. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Gallagher, from probably from all of us here today. Yeah, no I've driven up from uh, Dunsborough today to, to talk to you and I was wondering this twofold question. One is, can we see your smiling face as the country health men down in the Southwest Support Group for Myeloma? We'd love to see you down there. Absolutely. We're, we're a little bit isolated down there, unfortunately, although it's only a three-hour drive. And the second thing is that um, I'm on uh, lenalidomide and a DEX combination and have been for the last four years, but since December 2017, I've put it mildly, I had washing machine tummy, and I'm sure that a number of people here have the same problem. So to, to do a three-hour drive up here, of course, Imodium has to be my best friend. So I'm just wondering for those people that have experienced washing machine tummy, with the medication, is there anything that you can suggest that uh, can uh, block us up on the way through? <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah, no worries. So um, I guess to address both of those, yes, I'd be delighted to come down at some stage. We um, do have an increasing number of haematologists delivering services to uh, to the southwest region. Um, but yeah, I'd be very happy to pop down and uh, and have a chat at some stage. Um, uh, the the tummy upset, yeah, it's a bit of a tricky one. And I was obviously quite selective in talking about the various side effects of treatment. We certainly do see gastrointestinal upset with, with lenalidomide and a lot of the drugs. I don't really have a magic pill for it, unfortunately. It's kind of in many ways each each to their own as to what might work. So give Imodium a go, give anti-nausea medications a go. There's a variety of approaches. But um, sometimes if it's really problematic and you're in a uh, and bear in mind, you need to discuss this with your own haematologist, but you know, sometimes there might be a role if you're in a deep remission to actually reducing the dose of the lenalidomide or changing the frequency of the dosing a little bit as well. Um, but yeah, it's, it's going to be quite individual.